Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Doing a quick update video, I want to show people where the rules have kind of fleshed out from the Battle of Lhasa. The Battle of Lhasa, the start was just kind of a con conceptual idea. Um, and after playing like three turns, we're into the fourth turn now, a lot of um, ideas kind of permeated to the surface. The players had a lot of great ideas, how we could streamline things. We've been able to see a lot of pitfalls. So... I want to move away from the fixed skull missions, the, the, st the stacks of, you know, uh, mobile uh, mech units where you can just choose how much skulls you want to attack. We're going to move into a more unit based fight. And I think what I want to do is so rather than having an X now, uh, X amount of skulls um, for a unit, I'm going to remove the skull values completely from the enemy units. And we're going to go with a weight radio, weight ratio. So if we have a quick look at this, um, let's just tur turn this off and let's turn off the artillery for a second. So on the map board, the enemy is in, in uh, purple here, purple and green or purple and yellow. Uh, and you can see here there's multiple mech units that are on the board. Now there's five ratings. Originally I had it as four, but then somebody mentioned that it might be good to do it in five. So the scout class um, mechs that are on the board, um, so it's denoted, denoted with a small mech and an S. This is a half skull to one skull mech unit, like battle unit, whatever you want to call it. It's a unit that's on the board. That So that's your skull rating. If you want to attack this unit, it's a half to one skull. Um, the light units, similarly, with the L and a little bit bigger mech, I think this is a Jenner. Um, these are uh, one and a half to two skulls. Mediums are two and a half or three skulls. Heavies, obviously, you know, uh, four, or sorry, three, sorry, two and a half to three, right, three and a half to four, and then assaults four and a half to five, right? And it's just pretty much easy to tell by the mech and the letter beside them what kind of unit this is. Each of these is going to have its own movement value, so scouts and light mechs will be able to move up to high, five hexes on the board. Mediums will be able to move up to, to four. Heavies up to three. Assaults up to two. That may change based on um, the scale of the map. If the map's a lot bigger, the movement might go up a bit and the turn duration is actually a little longer. Um, I'm just kind of playing right now with arbit arbitrary turns. I'm not putting attaching time to it. But we can scale movement up and um, stealth and detection up um, up and down based on how big we want to make the hexes and how large the map is so the turn would go up the movement would extend um, like the turn time would go up the movement would extend and the range of you know your probes and stuff might go down because the hexes are technically smaller um, or it might go up sorry and if and then if, if their hexes are a lot smaller then the movement goes down the, the um, range of the Beagle active probes and stuff goes down a little bit. So we'll just do do everything to compensate, right? So any any unit like this, like light units, can have a BAP at the top. These are their scout units. Beagle active probe gives plus one detection range. So for the most part, um, I'm starting with like a detection range of, let's say, two. So any max up to two hexes away from a unit will be detected. If you have a Beagle active probe, that extends one range to three. Um, I haven't included on these counters yet, but on these counters I have. If the half of the unit has Guardian ECM or some kind of ECM, then that detection range drops by one. So if the unit that's approaching it doesn't have a Beagle Active Probe or any kind of probe to it, um, then this unit's only detectable one hex away, So which means you've got to be right next to it to spot it. Which could be bad if you're running an assault unit that's a stealth assault unit, which is why getting probes on at least one of your mechs uh, is always a good thing, because then at least you've always got those... <laughs> You've got the two hex detection range. It doesn't help you with assault that can move to because it can attack you, but at least you can spot it. Um, that I'm still working on, the detection range I'm still working on. Um, so as far as enemy units go, the only thing that's retained a skull unit or a skull value is the convoys. Um, I'm thinking about shifting those into heavy, medium, um, light, and scout. Um, but right now I've retained a skull value only because... Um, I want to have a fixed value for um, for convoys that are moving to denote how much crap they've got they're carrying with them. Um, 
because I'm working on a concept for supply. So if you if you take out a convoy and it's a four, right, you can capture up to X amount of that supply. So maybe half of the supply. So you can ca you can capture two supply from a, a convoy like this if you're able to truck it away. That is, but you know that that's going to be rolling back into a supply value. So convoys will be like one, two, three, four, or five in skull values. So that's kind of the idea I'm working on with that. Uh, we've got self-propelled artillery on the board, SPAs. Now this unit can't really defend itself on its own. Any hex in the unit can defend it. Um, but the self-propelled artillery is um, capturable. So it's basically unarmored art artillery units, like a long time unit um, that would set up and, and fire. Now the small number on this, I'm not sure if you can actually see it. If we move into the normal, like this is 100% scale, but um, so on the map, if you see the SP symbol, it's a self-propelled artillery. The hyphen A just means that this is unit A. So there could be multiples. So it would be unit B, unit C, unit D. And then the value here, the six, is the range it has. So th in this case, this unit's got a range of six. So one, two, three, four, five, six. It can actually fire on this unit. And each of the units will have their own um, targeting. So each turn when an artillery unit is about to fire or going to fire, it can interdict hexes, basically either forcing you to use extra movement to move through the hex or forcing you to go around it, depending on how fast you are. Haven't decided that yet, but it can also interdict you too. So if you're attacking a unit here, uh, if you've moved up and haven't attacked yet, or they're planning on attacking you on their turn, they can use their artillery to suppress you, which will increase their value for attacking. So um, a medium unit, which might be rated, let's say, let's say you find a mission for a medium unit at two and a half skulls, it would push the rating up to three skulls. So you then have to find a three skull mission to apply against you. Um, I'm not really sure, like that sounds okay in practice, but once again, the whole reason why I'm shifting to this kind of style is because we're having difficulty finding missions that match um, the units on the board. So I'm trying to make it as easy as possible to find those. So the artillery might only be for interdiction like this um, or to force you know um, players to go around a hex or stop you for a turn. If it's a heavy if, it, if it's a heavy bombardment of two or three of them hit you they may stop you for a turn. I don't know yet. Still working on that idea. The artillery can easily be dropped out of the game if it's not working and that's fine. Then in the on the um, airfield here like each of the each of the points on the map will be colored so these are all control points once you've taken all the control points you've won the match uh, the enemy is forced to retreat but each of the the points like control points will just be called point a point b point c and then if they've got any kind of um, additional bonuses to them like supply for instance this is a supply hex so it'll supply x amount of supply return if you need to repair your mechs you can do it here um, if you need to, like if your unit's out of supply because you've extended your supply line, this will actually act as a supply line for you. So you can put your units back into supply. Um, the airfield is obviously to an land air units. They can land and take off dropships from here, um, like larger scale dropships. So Union dropship um, has got a three on it. It's capable of carrying three units. So it could, it could land three assault mechs, like three assault units, or it could land a light, a medium, and a heavy unit. You have no idea, um, but that's what it's capable of doing. Leopards will only be dropping one unit, and then overlords will be dropping nine units. Um, it's just basically reflective of the number of lances it can carry. Then we have cargo aircraft. I'm still working on this idea. I'm not 100% sure if it's going to be making its way into the game, but if the airport, if you capture cargo aircraft or you actually have cargo aircraft, the number on it is the actual tonnage weight of stuff that it can, it can move around. So for instance, let's say we control the airfield and let's say you've got a unit in the field that you need to get reinforcements to. So you might be able to load like three 40 ton mechs on this and drop them off to you to your unit so if you've got if you're operating with like i've split up the night guns here into units a and b so let's say night got unit a is up here and it's fighting a couple of assaults and i know i'm in trouble and i'm on this hex here i can load 120 tons of my mechs from let's say if night guns b was here i can load 120 mechs so i might only be able to get two novas into that but i might be able to drop two novas over here to help these guys out for the next battle. Now, I know you could say, well, you're, you know, your dropships could fly in and, and do it. 
Um, I'm trying to limit the amount of dropship use to um, initial landings and resupply. Everything else is going to be kind of like a ground fight. Um, just because dropships are so valuable, the last thing you want to be doing is flying them over um, uh, enemy territory, especially when there's like um, enemy fighters that could shoot them down or cause heavy damage to them or artillery units that could target them and, and bring them down too. So, you know, aircraft, yes, they can be shot down and, and so on and so forth, but it's they're easier to put together than a dropship, if, if that makes sense. And then we've got fighters here. This is the number of air interdiction um, air interdictions that these guys can do. It, it will operate the same as artillery with the exception that fighters don't have range. So, you know, you'll have your allied fighters and your own allied artillery to, to limit their movements. Uh, every turn and you'll um, so the fighters can either fly a fighter cap meaning that if you have your air units that you want to use to interdict the enemy uh, or and, sl and slow them down or to increase um, your ability to attack them um, the fighters will um, like if it's a fighter cap will interdict your fighters and stop them from doing that uh, if they're using their attacks and they can attack you on their turn um, uh, interdicting your movement. I haven't 100% worked out the rules for that yet, but that's kind of the idea. Once again, if it's not working, we just take it out of the game. It's fine. We can just go with the mechs and convoys and, and the guns. Then we, I'm keeping the gun turrets as fixed skulls. So um, there's two things here. So the gun turrets themselves occupy a hex, and um, it's a fixed skull mission, so it is three skulls. But it can be any three skulls, so it can, like, it's a representative, like, three, three and a half. So, um, the same as you have the assault medium, so the threes would be three, three and a half, fours would be four, four and a half, whatever you can find. Um, either, you know, a recovery mission or um, a destroy base mission would work. Anything like that, um, that we are working against a fixed um, unit or a fixed emplacement, you're attacking some kind of base. Those are the kind of missions. Now, where the, the, the actual counter is located also dictates what the enemy can do. So a counter here, so for instance, this counter here has an interdiction value like a, or a zone of control against this hex next to it. So if you're moving your unit along here and want to attack the heavy unit, they have the option to interdict you and use this mech's turn to actually stop you here and force you into a fight. Um, I'm going to do it so that um, each turn is you move and then fight. So you move your distance as soon as you fight on your turn, your turn's over. Um, you don't get to move after your combat. So that way it's it's like it basically the enemy ties you up in combat until the end of the turn. Or you can move your full value and not fight at all. But as long as you're moving, like so for instance, um, I guess you should talk about the allied counters. So the allied counters, we got NG is the name of the unit. And A is which lance it is. So, for instance, I'm running the Night Gaunts, and we've got two full lances. So we have Alpha Lance and Bravo Lance. A rough value in skulls that I think the lance can probably take on. So this guy can probably take on a three and a half skull mission. Pretty much anything at three and a half skulls, and I think I would be okay. Same thing with these guys. Two and a half skulls, I think I would be okay with these guys. Then the numbers down here, numbers and letters. The first one is the movement points, how many movement points the unit will have. Um, and that will be based on the kind of units that you have in your um, lance. Um, both of these guys are clan mechs. They're actually relatively fast. So we, we got we have a three movement um, because they're at the medium value. Um, they, so they kind of got like a three movement. And then uh, the next one is the, the P is if you have a Beagle active probe. So if you've got a probe or any kind of active probe, then it would be noted, denoted by a P. Otherwise, it's just a dash for nothing. And then if your unit has at least half of the units in the unit, not including vehicles, at least half of the mechs have like a Guardian ECM or, or some kind of ECM system attached to them, um, then you know you get an S for stealth, meaning that you've got stealth active. So it basically the P would indicate that you've got one extra de detection hex, and the S means they have one less detection hex against you. Um, so you can see here the, the static def my static defense unit is rated at about two and a half skulls, roughly. It's got a movement of two because it's urban mechs, they ain't going anywhere. Even though they're light mechs, they're all urbans, so it's got to be two. Uh, they've got a Beagle active probe and they've got enough units with Guardian ECM. Same thing up here, 
uh, Dragon's Rejects Lance Alpha is a little slower. We have a Highlander, unfortunately, so it slows us down. But uh, the medium Lance here, um, all the other mechs are relatively fast, so we get a movement of three. And if you had a light Lance, like if you had like all mechs that are actually relatively quick, um, you might get up to four movement, or like in this case, because these guys are all like these guys are all dedicated light mechs, like Slocus and and Commandos and things like that. They're all fast mechs, so they've got a movement of five. Um, and then four, three, two, well, sorry, both of these have five, then four, and then three and two. So um, it's based on the skull value and the kind of mechs that you'd be, be going after. And then this is based on your own your own mechs and your own movement. So the heavier your lance, lance gets, the slower you can move, which means these guys can actually maneuver around you um, and get it out of your detection range, things like that. Um, or they can have a, unit, a fast unit moving back here, um, spotting you at a distance for the artillery, you know, whatever. So that's kind of the idea, but the idea here too behind this is the zone of control. So if you're moving forward, you got three, um, these guys have a chance to interdict you uh, and fight you. If the unit is in the center of the hex, it means that they're not. there's no interdiction possibility. So these guys have no interest in interdicting you. They just want to detect that you're there. So they're sitting in the center of the hex, the same thing as this. The gun batteries, it's the same thing. Um, these gun batteries can engage you if you're in the hex that they're they're uh, attached to so for instance if this wasn't here and this unit was here these guys can force you into a battle because half of the units here um, for the for the fixed emplacement are generally mobile units or if you're doing a recovery mission they're probably all mobile units um, they still have the ability to interdict you but they can't move right they have no ability to move around the board they're just basically a defensive unit that just stays there so these units here, like if you decide to take this airfield and you move in here, all of these units could general, could de technically attack you on the next turn, meaning you have to fight a whole bunch of battles, which is not what you want to do. So you'll want to take the hexes around the airfield first to clear out all the defenders before moving into the airfield. I think this works a little better. The way I had it before was there would be a stack of mobile units on here that you'd have to defeat first before you could defeat the base unit and then take over the base. This way... It uh, requires a little bit more strategy to figure out what you want to do. Like maybe you take three of the units and defeat this one, move two units in here, and then wait for these guys to counterattack and it's over, right? It just depends on how many units you have available. Once again, um, units per hex, it can be, you know, I'm probably going to come up with a value that limit it. Maybe it's six units, maybe it's three. I don't know. We'll have a limit to the amount of units that can be occupied in a hex. Um, one there can only be one fixed defender in any kind of hex at one time there can't be like two fixed defenders which is why these are kind of bordered around the airfield but connected to it um, so yeah I think I'm going to leave this one here I don't think there's any other concepts I was really working on but this kind of gives you an idea um, it, it may see, seem complicated at first and this map really isn't laid out as a proper tactical map so you really have no idea um, things will be spread out a lot more than this um, I'm planning on doing it in sectors. So, for instance, like this map right now is, if we go to the null here, um, quickly go to scale. So if we go back to full scale here and then just kind of move this over to where it should be. Right, so that's a lot. Like there's Like, there's the overall map there, right? So you'll get an overall map like this, but then I'm gonna, like I said, I'll, I'll divide it up into individual segments, like I've done with the Battle of Lhasa. So right now it looks a little confusing. Um, the overview map that we'll we'll run on will have a will look kind of like this, and if we bring this to 100%, this is kind of what it would look like. Um, actually, let's just do it this way. Probably a lot easier. So this is what it would look like. Um, when you're seeing it, like viewing it on your screen, um, it's a the map is set up as HD 1920 by 1080. So um, this is roughly the I mean it'll be slightly larger than this, but this is roughly the the size at 100% uh, that the map will look like to start the play. Um, and um, so you'll be able to see all your control points, what you do, what you need to do. And I forgot to attach these to the uh, null, so they're they kind of grew and got out of place but I'll fix that in a second um, so yeah so this is what it will look like on the front we'll divide it up into to spaces once again the hexes will have letters and numbers you can designate where you want to go we'll have one overview map of the entire situation so everybody can see what's happening 
and then when we do um, we are, we're actually playing we can divide it into zones who's taking what zone I'll just go back here real quick here we go uh, reduce this so um, let me just fix this real quick before I forget so now if I attach this to the null like this it actually scales when I scale this Hooray for After Effects! Oops, not position. Scale. Watch what you're doing. Right, everything scales with it. It's kind of nice. I love this program. It's one of the things I use at work all, all, like every day. So uh, anyway, um, yeah. So yeah. So when you're actually doing your individual battles, each one will be marked out in a in a train like this. So maybe it's just you and two other players that are in a certain zone. Um, and then on the Discord channel, we'll have, um, you know, a main channel for having the full map and then a channel for each of the individual um, areas that we're playing on. So, for instance, like if we, well, we might have units down here, units up here, the enemy will be over here, you know, wherever they end up being. Um, we can decide who's going to take what zone, who's going to be going after what targeting on a map like this. Um, uh, the idea was, can you, you know, can we have roads in the map? There's kind of a rough road here. Um, this is just from Google Earth. Um, so there's like rough roads here, but I will create roads. So it will be able to increase your movement speed. And then when you guys land and you decide what you want to do, um, you can set up your own supply bases back here, your own airfield um, to have interdiction values. Drop your units in, set up your attack figure out where everybody's going to go, and then the battle will commence. Most likely their, their light units will be up front, followed by mediums and heavies. Um, I'll have their entire complement set up here with their reinforcements off the map board. So, you know, for instance, the Battle of Lhasa right now, uh, the players don't have any ability to ac have access to their dropships, so they can't actually get off the planet right now. Things like that could, could fall into play depending on the uh, campaign if the enemy shows up with... Um, a large um, uh, space force, um, whether they've got warships or whatever it ends up being, um, they could interdict you and stop you from leaving the planet. Uh, we're going to run with the supply values as I've been running it. So um, being in good supply means you know you get generous uh, contracts when you're taking your mission, which means you're going to get good salvage and make good sea bills. If you're just in supply IS, that just means you're just playing at regular. Um, normal values and then if you're out of supply behind enemy lines things like that if you're cut off um, then you'll be playing with stingy values and really bad st sell store selling values so it could technically put you out of um, out of business um, for quite a while if you've got no supply um, and your mechs obviously you can't do much with your mechs and stuff so um, but yeah there's I mean I've got a whole bunch of rules that I'm still working on behind the scenes for for supply value um, capturing supply what it'll do to you what it does to the enemy um, things like that so you know capturing supply may you know limit their movements um, it could weaken the gun values like it could do a variety of things right uh, I'll just have to figure all that out but yeah I think I'm going to leave this one here. I think that's all I wanted to cover in this. Uh, the rules are still evolving. I've got a very large list of rules and stuff that I want to cover. But I, like I said, I want to make it as super easy and as streamlined as possible that, so that as soon as we start, everything is obvious um, what needs to be done. Um, if artillery and aircraft aren't working, they can come out of the game. Um, if the dropships aren't working, they can come out of the game. If aircraft's not working, it can come out of the game. If supply doesn't work, it can come out of the game. And if we're finding that none, like none of that works and we're just down to like mechs fighting across a map, that's fine too. Um, I just thought introducing a few other in individual elements might make it a little bit more interesting rather than just uh, doing straight up combat. Um, move, like move your piece on the board, do combat, move your piece on the board, do combat. This way it forces you to think about where you want to take, what you can do. Um, do you, want, do you want to try and eliminate the enemy air units with your air units first? What do you want to do? Um, artillery, you can see their artillery. Do you want to interdict their artillery? Um, so we've got our allied artillery that might be able to just do this, stopping them from firing for a turn, right? 
or if we have an air unit, you can use the air unit to stop the artillery from firing from a turn for a turn or so. Um, yeah, just things like that. And I'm working on baggage train ideas so that um, if you've got extra mechs that you're not using in your lance, let's say, um, you could have a baggage train unit behind you or a couple hexes behind you so that if you do lose a mech in battle and you need to replace it really quickly, um, or if a pilot goes down and you need to replace the pilot, um, you can pause for a turn, have the baggage train come up and then replace, you know, replace the pilot, uh, replace the mech, and then you're off and running again, right? So things like that. Um, still working on those ideas. Um, just trying, trying to make it as realistic as possible. If you, anyway, if you guys have any suggestions, please drop them in the comments in the uh, comment section down below. Uh, I know this video has gone on for a fair bit and I've been winded, uh, hot air winded again talking about it, but uh, I'm kind of really excited about this. Whether or not this actually um, takes off and we do it as a campaign, as a group of continuing with people playing, people aren't interested in it, I'm definitely going to be doing this for my future series, having multiple units and playing multiple battles across um, a front like this. It's definitely something I'm interested in. So much like I did with um, Battle for Astrakhazi, the next in the next incarnation of the battle for Astrakhazi is going to look like this and then once the battle for Astrakhazi is done which will most likely end after this kind of battle i might play a few more battles after that but the, it'll end after the next um uh, major campaign um then the next series i do will will be most likely be exactly like this it'll be um something along this lines but I am going to end this episode here. I hope you enjoyed it. Please comment, uh, drop your comments in the comment section down below. Until next time, we'll see you all later.